My name is Elsa Gallagher, and I am the Habitat Program Director for the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And I am going to be your moderator today for this webinar. We're very excited to be here, and we're happy that you could join us today. And if you are here to learn about pollinator habitat and how that can become a key component of utility scale solar projects, you are in the right place. If you're here otherwise, uh, you, might, you might check your uh, webinar. So uh, what we're bringing together for you today is two pretty big heavy hitters. Uh, both of them are experts in their field. Uh, one is Pete representing wildlife conservation, pollinator conservation. And the other expert we've got is Tyler and he is representing solar industry and solar sustainability for us today. Uh, they have a, uh, They've built quite a relationship between not just the companies, but also personally, as they work together to kind of crack the nut of having great quality habitat projects that go hand in hand with solar projects and all the requirements that, that, that follows there. So be prepared today to see some successes. You're gonna see some near misses and some works in progress. Uh, you're going to see the results of this collaborative relationship between not only our experts, but the solar industry as a whole and the conservation community. Before we get started, I want to remind you that this is being recorded. And then I would like you to know that if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to try and get to as many of those as possible once we're finished. If you'd like to put in the chat, uh, your name and where you're from, maybe the company that you represent, that'd be great. And we'll just keep track of those chat um, comments as well. But any questions you have, please put in the Q&A function and we'll address those as we move on. So as we get started, I'm going to uh, introduce Tyler. Tyler Kanchezeski is the Vice President of Sustainability, a board member, and also an investor in Innovative Solar uh, based out of Indiana. He has an MBA from Grand Valley State University with an emphasis in sustain sustainable enterprise and a BA from Holy Cross College in Notre Dame, which I hear he likes to show off the Notre Dame uh, area when people come visit. So I think if you ever want to get to Notre Dame, Tyler would give you a good tour of the facility. Um, Tyler's also taken on a role as sustainability manager for logistic a freight securement system manufacturer and supplier. And his goal is to help them implement sustainable and circular practices into various business activities. So we're excited to have this Indiana native with us here today. And uh, as Tyler passes on, he'll uh, Pete will introduce himself later in the program. So thank you for being here, Tyler, take it away. Great, thanks Elsa for the lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, with you, Pete, and uh, co-host this webinar um, mm -hmm. to represent Innovative Solar and the, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And it's it's been a joy working with you uh, over the past couple of years. And uh, uh, I got to say, I've learned I've learned so much from Pete and this in the field of pollinators. Um, so uh, I, I really look forward to uh, everyone learning uh, from Pete um, and just. To, to kick off uh, my slides, uh, I just want to share a little bit about uh, Innovative Solar and how we're practiced uh, or practicing sustainability uh, in a holistic way. Um, and we started that in um, roughly 2019 uh, is when we really uh, doubled down on, on uh, sustainability. And as you see on this slide here, um, the company started in 2008, and I've been with the company since uh, full time since about 2012. Um, sustainability was the bedrock, but we realized as the uh, solar industry was rapidly growing, um, there were things that we could do better um, to to be more, even more sustainable. Like, kind of uh, talk about as a company, what does being more sustainable mean to us? And a lot of great uh, methodologies out there. Uh, the triple bottom line is a popular one, which is uh, kind of focus on people, planet, profit, or kind of an environmental economic equality approach 
to sustainability for your organization. Ultimately, what we came up with was um, kind of our own triple bottom line, which is uh, minimizing waste in our operations, maximizing our environmental contribution, and uh, promoting sustainability with our partners and uh, with the communities that we're working in. And then we came up with three major goals and we're at about 515 megawatts of solar developed mostly in the Midwest. Uh, Innovatus is based in South Bend, Indiana, but um, we work across the Midwest and even um, nationally. So um, we wanna hit a gigawatt by 2025 and do it the right way with the sustainability practices in mind. We also uh, have a goal of being carbon neutral. Uh, we do travel a lot. There is a lot of energy needed um, to build a solar site. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure out, um, dial in exactly um, how much of the carbon emissions from the job sites we wanna account for. So we're still kind of figuring out a, a good calculator to figure out to be carbon neutral. Um, and then thought leadership, we really believe in uh, you know, sharing best practices and not, not keeping things too close to the vest, you know, as like a competitive advantage, we wanna promote sustainability. Um, I, for instance, I was just in Knox, Indiana, which is phase one of uh, the Mammoth Solar Farm, which is gonna be uh, like 1.3 gigawatts after the third phase. Uh, but they were really nice to let me come out there and, and tour the sites um, almost as a competitor. But, um, you know, our companies do specialize in, in different things. Innovatus, we're an EPC and a developer. Solve Energy is building that mammoth solar site, um, which they are an EPC and developer too. But we, we um, aren't exactly uh, competitors, and but the, they were so nice to let me come out and see their sites and kind of uh, do some brainstorming on how we can do things better. Um, so um, we have six best practices um, that our team has come up with. I'm not going to go through all of these. But basically, this is um, kind of like our um, circular system, per se, for sustainability and, and like looking at a solar site and trying to reduce emissions and think of it as let's be as eco-friendly as, as possible. So it goes from site design uh, to procuring equipment to the, you know, the materials that we're using to the construction, um, to the waste that's um, accumulated there on site, to the uh, vegetation, and then to like the, the, the maintenance of the site, uh, and then decommissioning the end life and, and even uh, six is working with the community and educating and uh, making sure all the positives of solar um, are uh, well known to the, the community that, where the solar system is. So um, obviously we're focusing today on, on vegetation and that's our, our fourth goal um, and one that, that I've really uh, have dove into the weeds. <laughs> uh, and um, it's been it's been a lot of fun, and it's it's been um, just so much so much to learn, and I'm learning every day. And I'm happy to be friends with Pete and the and Elsa, and Mary, and the Bean Butterfly team, and um, to to perfect this goal because um, in our sustainability report, uh, one of our big goals this year were to reach 75 percent of of our solar sites. Uh, to have pollinator habitat um, and meet more eco-friendly habitat. Um, so it's it's been it's been a, a pretty new initiative for us. Um, and it and it's I think been pretty new for the whole industry. It's in, in my mind, it's it's been really taken off. It's got a lot of buzz and there's a lot of talk about pollinator habitat, sheep grazing, and and all the benefits. And um, for Innovatus, this is kind of a just a quick rundown of some of the reasons why we were choosing to do pollinator habitat. A lot of this, you guys might already know, but um, 
I mean, for starters, the environmental impact, it's like a no brainer. And the one that really uh, excites me is like sequestering more carbon, which I think a lot of data is going to start coming out. Maybe Pete can speak to it a little bit more, but you know, yeah. these root systems grow deep, they're thick and they aerate the soil and create more soil health. And um, I, th I think we're really going to see some growth in uh, solar sites being carbon sinks for, um, um, you know, more, even more eco-friendly benefits to solar. So um, moving on, the operations and maintenance is a, is a huge one because, um, you know, if you're, if, historically, we've been doing Department of Transportation grass mixes or, uh, you know, like some fescue mixes, and they require a ton of maintenance uh, throughout the life of the project. So um, we're learning, you know, if we can do a pollinator habitat and the, spend time those first two, three years and really getting it established, we're gonna greatly reduce our maintenance costs uh, 10 years, 20, 25 years of life of the project. Uh, the agricultural and economic support, um, another kind of no brainer, you know, if we're creating more habitat for pollinating insects, you know, they can go to nearby, uh, you know, farms and help um, with pollinating and, um, doing working all of their magic um and then aesthetics uh you know when you know pete's going to share some pictures you know when it, when pollinator habitat looks good i mean it's you know what what's there to be then you know beautiful solar farm with you know beautiful flowers uh so um that that's some of the exciting stuff so um i just wanted to share a little bit about some of our sites um before we hand it off to Pete, um, this site, um, it's in uh, Auburn, Indiana. Uh, I think it's about a 15 megawatt solar farm. Um, and to be honest, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a home run by any means. Uh, the start of it, um, it, it's been really rocky. Uh, I mean, not, not to say the soil is rocky, but we just maybe didn't go about it the right way in terms of uh, site prep. Um, and we, we did partner, we were fortunate to partner with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund at this site. Uh, there, there's a ton of lessons learned in, in the, the bottom picture, that's not what you want. And Pete will get into uh, more specifics. Um, you know, the, even the top picture uh, looks, it looks better, but it's still not quite what we want. Um, so um, yeah, I think it just speaks to the importance of making sure you're doing the right site prep, not rushing into things because the vegetation can get out of control and weeds can get out of control quickly when you're talking about 31 acres. And in that picture there, you don't, you don't want that. And I know the first couple of years, it's gonna be mostly green. You're not gonna get it as much of the, the, you know, the flowers, but um, you, you still gotta, you know, do the right things when you're when you're getting into this, and and make sure you're working with the right people, the right companies, the right experts, to make sure the site's ready. Um, and then once it is planted, you have a, the right maintenance plan um, to really get things established. Um, another site in um, Logansport, Indiana, a, a bigger site. Um, close to 20 megawatt farm, um, you know, in the top left picture, you can see it. Uh, that's some of our leadership team out there. I was there. Uh, we, um, we actually hit some crazy like bedrock on this site. Like that was, um, unforeseen, uh, kind of deep, deeper down. So, uh, they had to get special, um, almost like mining, uh, equipment <laughs> to like, to get some of the, to drive some of the posts in. Um, so, um, definitely a really interesting site on the picture of the right, you see some black eyed Susans. So we did, we did partner with the bee and butterfly habitat fund. Um, and, um, you know, things are, things are a little bit better at this site versus, um, the Auburn site, but, uh, we've still, we still had some issues here, um, at this site because, um, it was a, a pretty wet site so pretty muddy um trying to find the right time uh to plant and the method to plant um 
so sometimes in, with Innovatus, we're a little bit in a sandwich of working with the, the system or the site owner, uh, trying to work with the, um, uh, either the seed company or the, the company that we're working with that's um, going to actually do the planting, do the, do the labor. And so we're kind of taking everything and trying to figure out these windows of time to plant. And then once we plant, follow the right step that the right steps that Pete's going to talk about to make sure it's a success. And it's a lot to juggle. Um, and I think we're getting better at it. We're definitely, you know, this is another site where we've had a lot of lessons learned um, and just realizing that it's not as simple as just throwing the seed down. <laughs> there's, it, there's, there's just so much that goes into it. Um, and um, the last site I wanted to bring up, these are two sites in uh, New York, Orange and Walton. Uh, between the two sites, with almost uh, 36 acres. A um, little bit more site prep went into this, um, into these projects. And uh, these, these are early on pictures, so you can already see the difference. Um, it looks more controlled, a little bit more uniform. Um, um, definitely more of a success. Um, I think this is going to be probably our, the, our first sites that we can actually feel really good about. Um, from an early on standpoint and um, be able to use that as a case study. Uh, again, um, sites that we partnered with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund on the seed design. Um, so um, yeah, I guess final you know, words before I hand it off to Pete, just I guess being, being trying to be as patient as you can. I know sometimes we, we have to get the vegetation down to close out a project or get slip approval or um financial clothes you name it uh pollinator habitat is i think the way to go uh, for you know really across the country and um it's just a matter of being patient working with the right folks and um being diligent with the site prep and um and then and then the maintenance of it and not just letting it go i mean you gotta you really gotta watch over it and i'm learning so much every day, like I said, and, and it, I think it's just going to continue. Um, and I'm really happy to be working with uh, Pete and his team. And uh, with that being said, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, hand, hand it over uh, to Pete. All right. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Here we go. So um, I'm a wildlife biologist. Um, I have spent my career working on trying to design, establish, and manage high quality habitat like this. And that's kind of kind of what the gig is. I'm coming to you today from central Nebraska. This is the view outside my office window. And I give this to you as part of my introduction to let you know that at my core, I'm, I'm a prairie guy. Okay, that's what I am. I come to you today wearing two hats, one of which is a business called Conservation Blueprint, in which we are a local ecotype wildflower seed business. And this is a group of dedicated people that just got off their hands and knees from picking purple poppy mallow seed. And the other hat that I wear is um, the executive director of the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And Tyler has already uh, mentioned this nonprofit that most of you have probably never heard of before, uh, but we're a nonprofit that works on private land, public land, corporate land, which you should interpret as any land. And we provide one-on-one -on -one technical guidance and access to free seed. Um, and it's in a manner that works really, really well with solar. That I'll kind of talk about a little bit later, but that's, that's a little bit um, of an introduction to my background. The next part of an introduction that I wanna give you is that for the most part, when I'm gonna talk about principles and philosophies and designs and things today, I'm talking about utility scale solar. Um, smaller projects, distributed scale, those sorts of things, sometimes, not always, but sometimes they're a different animal than a utility scale solar project and about the only similarities from my perspective, I'm a vegetation guy. The only similarities is that they have panels on them. 
but we're, we're going to talk about that, what the differences are, because they're really important for what we're going to talk about today. And I guess I'll just kind of open up by saying that I think this is an incredibly important and unique moment in time where the solar industry is interested in all the things that Tyler talked about. I don't think you could bump up to a solar developer that wouldn't be interested in every one of those core foundational thoughts that Tyler talked about. But there's uncertainty when it comes to this thing called pollinator habitat, because there's, when I meet with a solar developer the first time, these are the questions I get. Well, is it easy to establish? How much does it cost? How do you manage it? These are examples of questions that are out there because we don't have utility scale solar projects that have been around established like we're gonna talk about today that have been around for eight years, 12 years, 15 years in which we have real data points about, okay, here's what it's gonna to cost to manage these in the future. We don't have them. So right now there's a bunch of uncertainty where the industry is still kind of wondering about these things. The other thing about this uncertainty is I'll just start out by saying that this really comes down to what I call the art and science of meeting the project objectives. So for me personally, it's frustrating to me when a solar developer says, somebody gave us this, this seed mixture right here. And it's a really, really good seed mixture for pollinators, but it hasn't thought and considered all the other project objectives that have to be a part of that. Here's what I mean. When we're designing a seed mixture for a utility scale solar project, <clears throat> there is no less than 15 factors that go into the recipe for how we design that seed mixture. Here's some of them. And if you think about them, this isn't rocket science. Okay, the first one is how tall will the plants grow? We would prefer to use plants that do not grow taller than where the lower panel height is. That makes sense because if they grow taller, they're going to put shade on it. Okay, the next one is if we're trying to meet the goals that Tyler outlined, well, then we want to have plants that provide pollinator value. And please know that just because a plant produces a flower doesn't mean it's great. it has great pollinator value. So we want to design it to have great pollinator value. We want to think about future management. Okay, If that site is going to be mowed regularly, will the plants that we select tolerate regular mowing? We'll talk about that some more later on. I, I don't care if it's a $500 million project or a $50,000 project, every project has a budget and what that seed mixture costs is important. Coming up with a seed mixture where we can actually get enough of the seeds to plant that project is really important. Um, how quickly will it establish? Tyler already mentioned the SWIP and turning that project over. You know, if it's a, one of those big ones, a $500 million project, your uh, EPC might well want to be able to say that's established and turn it over so that uh, they can get paid. Longevity of the planting. If it's a, something like just say a 30-year lease agreement, will the mixture that we design last, function, and perform for 30 years? Um, obviously, we want to design a seed mixture that's adapted to the site, to the geography, the soil type, all of those sorts of things. Um, if for the mixture that goes within the array area, it's going to have to be a little bit of tolerance to shading. And then with the efficiency of solar panels, more and more projects are going to bifacial panels. The albedo effect is... Um, the amount of light that is reflected up. Well, if we can design a seed mixture that reflects more light from the ground up, that can produce more energy if it's a bifacial project. Okay, this is just 10, there's 15 of them, but I put these up here just to tell you 
it's an intricate recipe that has to be built to make all these things function. The other five are designing a seed mixture that will be less susceptible to fire. That might be important uh, in a project, making sure that we don't ha uh, have a fire go through there. They're, they're all really important, but I just want you to know it's complicated. And one of the complicating factors, maybe I shouldn't say complicating, the challenging factors is what is that lower panel height off of the ground? These are kind of the four common heights that we um, work with. And the difference between two feet and four feet is huge, okay? And I'm gonna give you some examples. We are finding that the utility scale solar industry is moving to a standard of the lower panel height being 20 to 24 inches off the ground, okay? Well, if we are working on a project like that, probably one of our first goals, if you go back to this page and we look at the vegetative height is, we wanna make sure that we're using plant species that don't grow taller than 18 inches. Well, guess what? <clears throat> that takes away lots of tools out of the toolbox. So a couple of things to think about. When you see a photo like this, and I don't know of anybody that would look at that and not say, hey, I'll take some of that. Well, one of the things that you wanna know in this photo is this is a project that has a 36 inch lower panel height, okay? Well, when we look at this utility scale solar project and what this looks like, it has a 24 inch lower panel height. Well, let me tell you, that 12 inches is huge in terms of how we can design a seed mixture. So it's just really, really important. And I like to describe it this way. The 36 inch lower panel height on the left versus the 24 inch lower panel uh, on the right. On the left side, I have lots and lots and lots of options. On the right side, I sometimes feel like about 95% of the plant options that I can pick from aren't available because they grow taller than 18, 20, 24 inches. Most plants do. So it's challenging, not impossible, but it's challenging. And that's kind of the perspective that I wanna uh, lead out with. And remember, for the most part, we're talking about utility scale solar projects here where it's far more common to have that lower panel height of 20 to 24 inches. So many of the things I'm going to say coming up here in this next section might not apply to a distributed scale or a smaller project where your lower panel height is 36 inches or 48 inches, things like that. I, uh, Tyler might appreciate this. I describe the solar projects with a 48 inch lower panel height as the great white whale. You hear about it, but you rarely ever see it. So anyway, if we got to work with those, we, we would have a lot more options. So it's challenging. So for that lower panel height, and again, remember that we're talking about utility scale solar stuff. Here is one of the seed mixtures that we have found that works. And I'm gonna, I'm going to circle around and tie this back to some of the challenges that Tyler outlined uh, that they've experienced. And this is an example of a seed mixture that we have gone to using within the array area, and I'll explain that in just a second as well, that is a combination of fescues, bluegrass, and white Dutch clover. Okay, so remember at the start of this, one of the things I said was, I'm a prairie guy. I live on the prairie. I look at the prairie outside my window. I want more prairie on the ground. A utility scale solar project with a lower panel height of 20 to 24 inches is not a prairie restoration project. It's just not very, it's, they're, they're, it's not a good fit, okay? If, if all I was interested in was prairie restoration, this would be something that I would be very unenthusiastic about planting. 
because it's not a native prairie. But this is what we're uh, using with success, and I'm going to show you what that looks like on utility scale. It has a very high seeding rate, 526 seeds per square foot. That's really, really high. And that is, again, to meet the ease of establishment, how quickly will it establish, and things like that. So that, that seed recommendation, and it is one of our seed recommendations, works really well until you bump up with ordinance language or things like that that say uh, that you need to establish the vegetative cover using only native plant species. And the reason is, is white Dutch clover, like essentially all of our clover species, alfalfa, sweet clover, all of those clover species that are commonly used in agriculture are all introduced plant species. So, that can bump into a problem there if that's the way the ordinance language reads. But I want to take just a second and show you that those species, even though they're introduced, are hugely beneficial to pollinator species. Here's one study out of Minnesota, and this was looking at honeybees. I'll explain this to you in just a second, but I want to tell you that the researchers actually collected the pollen off of the bee and did a DNA analysis of the pollen that told them what plant the pollen came from, okay? So when you look at this graph right here and you see number, first off the circle, a small circle versus a big, big circle is how much of that species pollen were they collecting? The larger the circle, the more they were focused on that species. And then the length of the line of how long the circles runs is reflective of how long throughout the year were the bees collecting it. So this starts at the start of June and ends in the middle of September, which is our typical growing season. And when you look at these species, the first thing I wanna point out is that the clover species were the ones that honeybees we're absolutely focusing on and working on collecting the most of for the longest period of time. And if we had the ability to collect pollen off of native bees, that's an entirely different critter. They don't come back to a communal hive. So much harder to do. We would find very similar results. Other results out there show that these clover species are highly beneficial for native bees as well. So it's an introduced plant, but it produces a lot of value. So somebody's probably watching this right now and they're thinking, well, that's grass and white Dutch clover. That's you know only gonna get you so far. You are correct, which is why we approach, we the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, approach utility scale solar projects by establishing two different seed mixtures. This is a real world project. And when you look at this, all of this pink area with kind of the black squigglies on it, that's the solar array area of the project, okay? <clears throat> and we, and in this project, like many of our projects, we designed and used the fescues, the bluegrass and white Dutch clover, okay? Then in the areas of the project, where we have a chunk of space and we don't have panels over it, that's all of these green areas, we establish a more traditional pollinator seed mixture that has a minimum of 40, four, zero, 40 wildflower species in it. It's 100% a native seed mixture and it goes on between 10 and 20% of the project varies by project. Usually inside the fence, sometimes like this brown spot, outside the fence, okay? So we use two seed mixtures and we think that we can meet the needs of the project with this seed mixture in the pink area and then the pollinator uh, needs, broad pollinator needs with the green area. And if you look at this, I referenced chunks 
in here, know that we would only plant that on a piece that is at least two acres in size or larger because we think that that's about the size that you're going to need to be able to manage this area, this 2.3 acres, different from this 55 acres for 30 years. If we tried to put the green pollinator mixture in this long, narrow strip, we don't think that it is, um, we don't think it's likely that that seed mixture could be managed and treated differently than the rest of the project over a 30 year period. And I'll talk about that uh, some more as well. So how does this approach work? Well, in about 16 states, there's this thing called a solar pollinator scorecard. I'm going to show you one example of this approach using the Indiana scorecard. You don't have to worry about all the information in there. Just know that this two seed mixture approach using those two types of seed mixtures on this scorecard scored 115 points, which is right in the middle of the road of what meets the preliminary standards to be called solar and pollinator friendly, all right? So um, I wanna swing around kind of the last uh, part of this and talk about what we think keys to success are. And Tyler talked about how this has been a learning process, but we wanna shorten the learning curve up and show you what we think are three or four keys to the success that you'll have uh, establishing and managing vegetative cover on your project. The first is site preparation. Whether it's a solar project or a project with a private landowner or a state agency or wherever it is, site preparation is the key. If you have existing uh, vegetation, that might mean removing it. If you're putting in a project that was formerly agricultural production land, that's going to mean controlling the volunteer weeds that are absolutely going to come back uh, into that site. So site prep is really important. The next one that we think is really an interesting, important conversation is, do you want to establish that final vegetative cover pre-construction or post-construction? And one of the things that we're seeing is more and more and more projects are going to establishing it prior to construction. I'm a fan of it because we think that you can get a better, more uniform cover established. And then we enter that process knowing there's going to be some of it that is gonna to have to be replanted. Because post-construction can have all kinds of challenges associated with it. Going around panels, going around pilings, um, dealing with the aftermath of construction, and it can be challenging to get your final vegetative cover established. So unless a site has a significant amount of grading that occurs on it, we think that if you can be at about 30% or less of the area that would need to be replanted, that works from a cost benefit analysis. Whether you have a one acre personal solar project or you're a 3,000 acre monolith that's out there, have a vegetation management plan that guides you through site prep, planting, when to plant, how to plant, what equipment to plant to use, and that sort of thing. Something that takes you through all the different details. If you're gonna use a cover crop, what cover crop do you use? How do you manage it going forward? And a vegetation management plan that provides very, very specific detail. I, I can't stress enough how important I think that is. I, sometimes I jokingly say to people that on the big utility scale stuff, the, veg, the final vegetative cover is about 0.1% of the total project budget but yet it's the thing that can throw the whole project into disarray um, if the final vegetative cover is not established. Mowing height is certainly a really important consideration 
here's a piece of equipment that um, we think might be able uh, to work real well because one of the things that we want we have in our management recommendations is that once it's established pollinator habitat not be mowed short to the ground but more like nine to twelve inches off the ground uh, like you see in this image right here all right here's perhaps one of the most important things I can relate today. Here is a real world photo taken from this spring from a utility scale solar project that shows the exact moment in time that management has to be considered. Here's what I mean. When you're looking at this photo, you're probably looking at it thinking, well, I'm not sure what I'm seeing. Here's the fescues. Here's the bluegrass. Here's the white Dutch clover, okay? Seeds have germinated, it's beginning to establish. The site is turning green, looks good. This, this project went on to former agricultural production ground. And the other things that you see in this photo are absolutely expected. Here's what we see. Pigweed, perhaps the most formidable weed that you can deal with. Mare's tail, velvet leaf, dandelion, curl dock, and giant ragweed, all in one photo. This is the exact moment in time that if this site doesn't begin to receive management, and in this case, I'm probably talking about mowing, this is a project that could get away from you and have the potential um, to really damage that final vegetative cover. All, almost all of these species that you see right here, the weed species, are uh, very aggressive, produce a ton of seeds, and are allelopathic, which means that plant produces a chemical that goes into the soil that prevents other seeds from germinating and growing. This is the exact moment in time when it needs to be managed. So what is management of that array area seed mixture look like? Here is an example of a broadcast seeded solar array project three months after planting and it received management. Three months, not too bad. Different project. This one was actually planted with a drill same seed mixture. This is four months after planting. And again, it received management and mowing. And that seed mixture with timely, appropriate management, this is what it looks like in year two. Okay. And this one happened to be broadcast seeded. And that would be that would be a well-established final vegetative cover. And then remember in the perimeter of the area is our traditional pollinator habitat. So what does it look like? What can it look like without management? This is an example, same seed mixture, and those plant species that again are allelopathic are out competing our seed mixture and producing a chemical going into the soil that is inhibiting the growth of our final vegetative cover establishment. This is just three months after planting, and it has not been managed yet. One more example um, is this one that is about four months after planting. It actually has locust trees that are coming up in here um, and really needs management bad. So that's the recommendation that we want to pass along that we Try to design seed mixtures that are a little bit bulletproof, but they're going to need management on them as well. Last thought. Um, it's not very hard to look at a photo like this and say, well, I would really like to see stuff that looks like that in our solar array project. And one of the really important things that you have to consider if your solar project is going to be mowed on an annual basis, once a year, twice a year, whether it's for fire concerns or other management, 
our native wildflower species are not going to tolerate regular routine mowing. So those are some of the management considerations and things that we have to think about if we're recommending seed mixtures that contain an abundance of native wildflowers. All right, last slide for me, and then we're gonna go back to Elsa and we're gonna take your questions, is I wanna to announce to you that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, probably in January, is going to announce a new program that will involve three really unique things. A staff working with utility scale solar projects to establish high quality pollinator habitat, that's number one. Then that project will receive five years worth of pollinator monitoring, specifically related to milkweed abundance and monarch butterflies that will come back into the CCAA uh, related to the Endangered Species Act. And if you're sitting there wondering, what does that mean? That's a whole nother presentation that would uh, take 45 minutes. But the third component of this is we will also be bringing a minimum of six years worth of carbon sequestration monitoring to each project. Getting the baseline data before the project starts and then monitoring any carbon sequestration gains that occur because of the specifically designed and selected seed mixtures that we'll be using on the site. The announcement about this will likely be coming in January. I gave you just a sneak peek uh, at it, but uh, that's coming and we're excited uh, to tell you that that's coming and, be, and get that ready uh, to provide those sorts of benefits. So with that, I'll ask Tyler to come back and Elsa is going to come back and slide in here and uh, we're going to start taking your questions. And we really appreciate your time and attention today. This is, for me, what an important, fascinating conversation uh, that we're having. And uh, I really salute Tyler and Innovatus for being leaders in this effort. Thanks, Pete. You Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we, we have uh, managed to keep over 200 attendees for the bulk of this uh, presentation. So I think uh, you're keeping their attention. We're going to go 10 more minutes with questions because that's all the time we have to keep us in that hour. So I'm going to just jump right in and we won't get to all of them. I know that, but I'm going to start. And Tyler, I'm going to start with our early question that came on when you were first talking about your uh, triple bottom line and you showed that, that graphic. Uh, one of the questions is, how does maximize our environmental contribution represent the profit component of that triple bottom line? You had that listed under the profit component yeah. of that triple bottom line. How does that work? The idea there is, you know, we're still a business and, and, and you know, we're still trying to be profitable. So the, the big idea is that the more profit we make as a company, the more we can contribute back to the environment or do things like charitable contributions or, or invest uh, in things um, that are, uh, you know, better for the planet. So that's part of the idea. Uh, but also we believe that um, the more our company is environmentally focused, that more people will want to work with us and thus will be, you know, will generate more business. So it's like, if we're doing it the right way, um, you know, and, and this is staying far away from greenwashing, right? Cause you can say, Hey, uh, we're, we're doing these green things. We're, we're, we're better than our competitors because of this and this, you know, and, and we have to be careful with that because we're in a, a period of time now, I think we're going to see a lot of greenwashing um, across all industries because sustainability is a, the you know it's a buzzword. Climate change, so um, but we're we're about doing it the right way, and um, so yeah, the more the more we can um, make, the more we can give back to the environment. The I guess the concept kind of comes from one percent for the planet uh, that group Yvonne Chenard started out of Patagonia about. Um, 
making part of your business, giving back to the planet, right? Because it's our only home and why are we destroying it? Um, so yeah, that's, that's the idea. Great question. Well, I have a, a question, a few questions on the lower and higher panel heights. Um, Tom from Minnesota asks, what is the cost difference between the lower and the higher panel heights? So Pete made a really clear argument for higher panel heights. Um, what would be that cost difference, Tyler? You know, a 24 inch versus a 36 inch or even a, you know, the white whale yeah. of the 48 incher. So I can definitely speak to the 24 versus 30 inch or, or 36. Um, the studies, um, the data that I've seen, working with our team on quoting materials and quoting labor, it's very minimal when you go from 24 inch to, to 30 inch or 36 inch. I, I was really surprised. In my head, I'm thinking, you know, why, why are we even doing 20, 18 to 24 inch um, when 30 to 36 is barely uh, an increase? It, you know, it does depend on, on the manufacturer, the racking manufacturer you're using. It does depend on the labor that you're using to uh, do the installation and, and quote that height difference. But um, yeah, th it's not much added material to go deeper or to go higher. Um, and it's it's really not that much added labor. I think the biggest difference, and I'd like to see more of this, um, is the comparison to 48 inch uh, versus, versus 36. You know, that that's where you might be jumping up a little a little bit. Um, but yeah, for utility scale solar, you know, we've been trying to set 30 inch as, uh, as kind of like the benchmark to not go below 30 inch. Um, and, and we're doing projects of up to 200 megawatts now. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're, um, we're not really too worried about the cost. Uh, it's, it's pretty minimal. Okay. Great. Um, Pete, I have a question here for you from Karen yeah. that says, do I get um, to do I get to talk oh, about what it costs? The cost? People oh, might well, want, you're, yeah, people you're might talk want about like a money, real like a real number. Yeah, yeah. So that utility scale solar mixture is right around two hundred and ninety dollars an acre, and the uh, forty four zero, not a small number, wildflower species mix that goes around the perimeter is mm, three forty, three hundred and forty, something like that. So. Depending on your perspective, you might think that's expensive or not. Um, if you're looking at, uh, Tyler, I think you referenced uh, traditionally going back to like DOT mixtures and that sort of thing, should be like right in that ballpark. And that's one of the goals. If you remember those 15 objectives, cost was one of them. And if, if a pollinator seed mixture is exorbitantly more expensive, than what kind of the industry has always done, then that's another factor that doesn't work well. So our goal is to make those things pretty equal. That's good, because that was a question I was just gonna ask you was about the cost of the pollinator seeding being much higher. Okay. So I don't have to ask that one now. Okay. <laughs> so I'll ask a different one. Um, in order to ensure that a utility scale site leaves sufficient space to cover the 10 to 20% with the high quality habitat. So I think they're talking about making sure the site's large enough to incorporate the high diversity planting as well as the under mm -hmm. the array planting. How early in the project planning process would Tyler, you need to involve a group like Bee and Butterfly Habitat? Uh, how early in the process are those decisions made? And that could go to either one of you. I mean, obviously, you know, Pete, I know what you'll say. Get us in there early. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I mean, sooner the better. I, I mean, uh, we haven't, we haven't mobilized on a site yet in Indiana, and I, and and I've already been like engaging with folks uh, about, you know, you know, the seed mixture you know, design and um, site prep. But you know, so I, I think, I think right, right from the beginning, really. Um, the vegetation in some ways is just as important as the 
electricity that's going to be generated by the solar panels. Um, I, I think it's easy for the solar system to take precedent over the vegetation. But uh, I, I, what I've learned is that really the vegetation is a lot of ways just as important as the electricity that's going to be generated out there. Yeah, I, I would add, you know, if I had a magic wand, I would wave it and say that um, the vegetation management folks, whether you're writing a vegetation management plan or designing a seed mixture or whatever, you're involved in the project before the train pulls out of the station. The earlier you are involved, the more you can have a conversation where I would chat with somebody like Tyler and I would listen very closely to what are the objectives of their project, okay? Tyler outlined them very clearly for this group in his opening. Those are our kind of overarching objectives. Then what do you specifically have for this project? And then how can we design a seed mixture to meet that? And if one of those objectives is to have that second seed mixture in there uh, on the perimeter, then we talk about how that works. And retrofitting it is not as easy as having the conversation on the front end where it is a designed component of the project. So I'm gonna ask you one last question just because we're gonna run out of time and there's about a million more questions, which we will uh, try and you know take these questions down and answer them individually back to the, to the folks that have asked. There's no way we're gonna to get to them, but it's just a follow-up to what you were both talking about. You, you kind of walk that fence of, um, oh, that's a great question. How does the work, how does it work when the developing company creating the management plan is different than the company who's actually doing the planting? And I, I know this is, a, this is a good subject because we've had some, what we talked about early on with some of the misses and, you know, some of uh, the, we're still in processes with some. So uh, you, well, I, I have an opinion, but. I have an opinion, but do you want to go first, Tyler, or you want me to go with my? Yeah, my, my yeah. answer will be based on real-world experience. Go for it. Okay. Um, it. For me personally, it's been. This goes back to the we. You want to be involved in it as early as you can, so that all of this is built into the design of the project. The later into the effort you come, the more you can have an EPC that has already been selected, already bid it on doing it using X strategy to build it. And then it becomes harder to make changes to add these things, what I keep referring to as retrofitting. So the earlier you're involved, the better. And it is almost, not it's about like the white whale, it is very rare that the person writing the vegetation management plan, designing the seed mixture, procuring the seed would be the entity that is establishing it. It can be, but it's very rare. So um, I don't know how many layers there are in a typical utility scale solar project, but there's a lot between uh, the solar developer and then all the layers of that club sandwich down to a little person like me sitting there at a desk designing a seed mixture. There's a lot of layers. And so that produces, can produce challenging uh, ways of relaying information uh, up and down that system. Yeah, yeah, and I would just add that there's, like Pete said, it's a club sandwich of all the parties involved and everyone's trying to make each other happy trying to meet deadlines, trying to meet expectations. And then sometimes, um, you know, you move forward on a path and it, and, and it doesn't always work. So that's why I, I go back to just earlier when I said is be as patient and diligent as possible and, and be honest with each other, you know, whoever you're working with, because um, if you're just trying to make each other happy and trying to meet deadlines and trying to meet costs. And I mean, it might not always work. Um, so I think people just need to be brutally honest and, and, and not be afraid to lose business too. Like just because you can't meet a cost or an expectation or a timeline, or you don't think something's gonna be successful. Like um, I would just be brutally honest and lose the business versus do something that ends up being um, not so great. So <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, Elsa, I know we're out of time, but while we've been on here, I have personally been trying to type responses to some of the questions. I don't know if everybody can see those. I hope so. I'm well, I think not trying we to can... just send it to just the individual, but I have uh, I have been trying to do that. But holy smokes, are there a lot of questions? Out yeah, there. there are a lot. Great There's ones. A lot, a lot great of interest questions. in this too. This is great. All right, I've got the next question, and I think this uh, maybe was specific to Tyler, but it might not have been. The question was early on in the program. Tyler, uh, are you using regenerative agriculture principles? Great, great question. Um, B and I, I'd say yes. Um, you know, I think the idea is to improve soil health and quality. Um, you know, erosion control, doing a lot of great things with uh, the pollinator habitat. And if you want to remove the solar array, you know, at its end life, uh, instead of replacing and putting in new panels, um, let's say 25, 30 years down the road, I think that that uh, land you you could return back to uh, farming of your of your choice. Um, so um, I know there's a lot to regenerative agriculture, and it's a it's a new newer topic to many. Uh, but I think the idea is that you're not um, totally um, diminishing the soil health, and you're and you're if anything improving the soil health, and that, that's that's definitely part of the goal with pollinator habitat. Yeah, and Elsa, I'll just jump in and say that <clears throat> that's absolutely one of the 15 objectives that I talked about in seed mixture design is soil health, carbon sequestration, uh, erosion control, water quality, all of those things go into that recipe where you try to make all those different things fit and sync together. There's a, there are a few questions here about uh, the territory of a honeybee, how far they'll travel. And, and that might roll into the question, Pete, that is about 40 species seems very high and expensive. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on kind of those, those two things? Yeah, well, just because there's more species in a seed mixture does not mean that it's more expensive because our seed mixtures are built based on how many seeds are there in a square foot of ground. So that seed mixture is designed thinking about all of those different objectives. We like to have as many species as we can. And we said more than 40, it's usually 60, 65-ish, because if you have a wet year versus a dry year, a hot year versus a cold year, Part of the site has clay on it. Part of it is sandy. The more species you put in your seed mixture, something over time is going to settle in and do well and perform well uh, on the site. So it's another way of ensuring that we have great results. And we already talked about the prices, but for solar projects like we've been talking about and describing in this presentation, that array area seed mixture with the 500 and some seeds per square foot is about $290 an acre. And the perimeter traditional pollinator seed mixture was around 340 ish $340, something like that. So not a big jump there. Yep. For the benefit, the added benefit. So I've got a question about, this is about the listing in long term, it's about the listing, potential listing of the monarch butterfly as an endangered species. This mm -hmm. uh, participant said that they have spoken to many facilities and power companies about doing more pollinator friendly plantings, but they don't want to because it might draw in the soon to be listed monarch butterfly and cause problems with maintenance or decommissioning. How do you handle that? um that issue how, how i know that's on your radar screen pete what what yeah. are your thoughts about that subject so T tyler might well be able to uh talk to this from the uh energy industry standpoint but there is a um what i'll describe as a get out of jail free card that is available uniquely for the energy industry 
That is the Monarch CCAA that basically, I'm, I'm going to use very layman's terms for a complicated issue, but if the energy industry joins that Monarch CCAA, they are basically grandfathered in so that if they do management and activities that, that attract monarch butterflies and it were to become listed, they're not going to have the, their ability to perform activities on their uh, impinged. So that is a really important part of the solar synergy program that I teased at the end of the presentation and said that we would be announcing that in, in January of 2023. That is where we're going to have our friends at Monarch Joint Venture come and do actual pollinator monitoring on the site for five years. And they actually have a new ability to do, use remote sensing that identifies and quantifies milkweed on the site. Okay. And, and if you want to think about how complicated a monarch butterfly potential endangered species act listing could be. Think about the geography that the butterfly covers, and then think about that it's in your backyard, and your backyard, and my backyard. How often has everybody you meet on the street been able to raise their hand and say, yeah, I have an endangered species in my backyard? It has the potential to be uber, uber complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I don't have a whole lot to add other than we we do be in, in, in solar and especially in Indiana deal with the um like as I think it's the Indiana brown bat. And so we're we're aware and working with endangered species and um you know occasionally with some of these solar sites you have to remove a few trees, which I hate doing. <laughs> and I, I'm I'm the first guy on our team to say, wait, wait, do we have to remove these trees? Okay. If we do, let's plant new trees. Um, but there's only a certain time of the year when you can remove some of these trees because of the Indiana brown bat. Um, so um, we're, we're already experienced dealing with endangered species. I, I think me personally, it'll, I think it'll be great to have that protection um, so we can do, do more things mm -hmm. uh, and get more creative and work with firms like the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Funder Conservation Blueprint on, on some of these cool projects. I know some people, you know, and just in terms of being a pure solar developer, they're gonna probably scratch their heads a little bit, but being more my environmental roots, I'd be excited for something like that. Well, little known fact, Tyler, I actually studied the Indiana bat in grad school or before grad school. Ah, I knitted nice. a bunch of them in Missouri, so it was a lot of fun. Very cool. Well, well I have a question here um, from Chris that asks, once the vegetation on a project starts to go off the rails, what are your best tools for getting that vegetation back on track? Mm. <laughs> for, I guess I'll go first, Tyler. First thing is, if it gets off the rails, it's painful. It's expensive, it's time consuming. It throws construction schedules off. By all means, that, that's the role that um, we try to take with vegetation management plan creations and that sort of thing of let's give you a plan that can be followed. Remember the club sandwich of solar uh, analogy we made? A plan that everybody in that club sandwich is aware of and can kind of know, here's the timelines, here's the steps, here's what we need to do so that it doesn't go off the rails. Because when you're involved in a utility scale solar project that has to be replanted because of a failed establishment, that is uber, uber painful. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is painful. And, and one of our sites uh that i brought up earlier auburn is looking like i mean it's pretty much this situation to a t where um well i think i think our management plan right is just to to mow it down right pete and then try to and go back um in the spring to see what's manageable or what has to be replanted um yeah so 
Yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> and Elsa, I would just say that <clears throat> invariably, um, before you go forward, you have to figure out why something went off the rails. And something, when it goes off the rails, there's always really an identifiable point. It was planted too late. Um, it wasn't, you know, planted using uh, the correct equipment. It was, you know, we didn't get seed soil contact. Uh, existing vegetation wasn't controlled. Weeds weren't controlled. There's a reason why it happens. But that's also why um, the solar array mix that we've described in this presentation, which is not prairie restoration, again, I've said that before, but it's designed because it's close to being bulletproof. It's hard to grow, it's hard to go wrong and to have that uh, not make it. Yep. Yep, that was, uh, we're, we're gonna be wrapping this up now, gentlemen, but I'm gonna ask one last question and I would like each of you to respond to that question. <laughs> When speaking to property owners, how would you answer the question, what's in it for me? And is that property owner uh, as in the solar array or the actual landowner? Because sometimes that's that's a difference. Well, I, I mean, I'm gonna let you, Tyler, I'm gonna let you respond assume. to both, Tyler. Respond to both but of them. Let's assume, because I, I think if we don't know where the question came from, but I think if we followed the breadcrumb trail back, this might be related to when a solar developer is going around and literally knocking on a door and talking to a private landowner saying, you know, we've identified this area as potential for a solar array. Um, I think the question is, you know, what, why would a landowner say yes or no? I'll go with that. Yeah, I like it. Um, well, I mean, you definitely if you're so if you're the landowner, a solar developer comes to your door, says, "Hey, I want to put solar here." You're gonna you're gonna make money off the land. Um, I mean, you're gonna lease a certain dollar amount per acre, um, and you know how does that compare to you know if you have profitable crop out there? I, I think. Our research shows here in Indiana that you can actually do make more money with uh, leasing your land for solar versus, you know, crop that you would be producing out there. Uh, I don't know what it is state to state or what you know no. specific crops you know maybe are more profitable. But um, you know all the things that I mentioned earlier, environmentally, you're going to improve the the soil health there. So if you ever do want to return that land back um, to uh, producing crop, um, you're going to do so with much more efficiency, you know, if everything goes right. You know, Pete, I'm sure you have more to add to that. Well, I think it's the, the simple answer is also, it's an individual cost benefit analysis that each person considers with all the factors that factor into their personal cost benefit. Um, I have um, been associated with projects where a landowner has enrolled their entire farm, been associated with projects where landowners have enrolled portions of their farm, and almost always selecting the areas that have a sort of reduced return on investment. And then certainly landowners that are like, we're not interested. And those are all personal individual decisions. But um, if all you looked at is can I make more money doing this versus this? Solar is a very viable option. I'm not, you know, th th there are, that's not the only factor that people use. But if that were the primary driving factor, uh, so the solar option can work very well. But obviously, there's a lot more factors than just. And that, and that would be a follow up question maybe to Tyler. Do you find that people respond positively to? The it, having the pollinator planting as a part of the solar does that does that help with the pitch? Does having the pollinator habitat there and the benefits it provide is that a part of the pitch to to talk them um, into maybe having that site 
turn into a solar site on their place. Yeah, I I do think it it, it sweetens the overall deal and, and makes everything um, make more sense. And we have had more ease, more traction when we talk about the pollinator habitat and all the all the benefits, the environmental benefits to it um, and the aesthetic benefits, you know, it, either they're gonna potentially see more color out there, you know, and, and solar in general, these, you know, as Pete's been talking about, utility scale solar has been booming and um, that's what we focused on today, talking about establishing habitat for utility scale. Um, you know, it does take up a lot of land and I think there is some worry about, you know, negative the negative impacts of, of large scale solar development and um but what what we've been learning is actually um yeah you have to impact the land a little bit when you're installing the panels but then you just then it sits there for 20 to 30 years and you're letting the land rest actually um and i think that's pretty cool to you know when you're when you talk big picture climate change you know how we're how we need to let the earth heal a little bit you know these solar sites can can do that that you're producing clean energy and letting the ground heal right so that's some pretty cool stuff yep well i think that brings us to an end of the questions gentlemen all right sure well this is, this has really been a fun webinar uh love the topic it's an important topic really appreciate uh what you've brought to the webinar today tyler thanks so much for giving us your time and experience on this great topic. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, it was a pleasure uh, co-hosting with you. I look forward to uh, doing another one. And thanks, Elsa, right, for moderating the Bee and Butterfly Habitat team for really uh, paving the way for this webinar. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.